the day, amazing viewers. Ready for some fun with part 2 of yesterday's story. Find a comfortable spot, maybe with a refreshing drink, and let's start today's story. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. I went to the club, changed into some casual golf attire, and hit a couple of bags of balls. Afterwards I worked on my pathetic putting. I sadly figured with a single life around the corner, I'd have some serious time to shave a couple strokes off my game. Unfortunately, given the circumstances that didn't make me feel too much better. After a couple hours I settled into the men's locker room, grabbed a beer, and shot the sheet with a handful of fellow duffers. One of them was Tom Harris, a local investment banker who was a good friend. As we talked, I learned his wife Connie was out of town for the weekend visiting her folks in Denver, so I invited him to dinner. We hit the Mulberry Stee Tavern downtown right as they opened at 4pm. We enjoyed a couple of bourbons and their world-class burgers. They had the Cardinals Mets game on the big screen. For all my turmoil, having a burger and debating pitching staffs with my friend felt like a small sliver of normal, for which I was grateful. We left around 7pm, and I checked my cell phone. There were 6 text messages from Lynn all spaced about 30 minutes apart, beginning about an hour after I'd left. Ty, I'm sorry, please come home so we can talk. Ty where are you, come home. Stop ignoring me Ty, I know you're seeing these texts. Get home now. WTF Ty. Fine, but don't say I didn't ask you to come home. I'm not the one being a stubborn a-hole. No, I thought to myself, you're just the one being a lying cheating slut. I didn't reply. Instead, I hit a local movie theater. I saw the new release, Firestarter about a young girl who discovers she can burn shit up just by using her brain. Too bad I couldn't find her and take her by Banks place. The movie let out just before 10 and I headed home. I pulled into the driveway and Lynn's car was gone. I can't say I was disappointed, but I also realized she was probably being consoled by her lover. By consoled I mean ducked. I drove back to the club and had a couple of nightcaps then returned home about 11.30. Lynn was back. She was sitting in our bed, freshly showered, probably because she was freshly ducked. Ty, I can't believe you left and didn't return my texts. Where did you go? Her tone was firm indicating she believed she was the offended party. Well, in order, the club, out a dinner with Tom Harris, a movie, home, back to the club since you weren't here, then back again. You? She looked down for the briefest second, not meeting my eyes. Nowhere in particular. Were you with anyone? Not really, ran into a friend at grounds for celebration coffee shop. Two. Does it matter? We need to talk about what happened earlier. Fine, fire away. Ty, I'm sorry I overreacted, but your aggression startled me, and I was confused. You threw me off balance and made me respond defensively. Your groping and pawing wasn't a turn on for me. Part of my love for you is based on how much you respect me, and your actions were anything but loving and respectful. Lin, I admit what I did was different, but you encouraging me to spice it up a bit a while back, seemed to indicate you wanted some newness brought into our physical relationship. Something a little racier. If that isn't it, then define it for me so I understand where you're coming from. I did say that, but I was thinking more romantic in nature. A candlelit dinner, or a weekend beach getaway with lots of cuddling and fondling. Sorry Lynn, but we've done all that tons of times in the last 8 years. Weekends away, long walks holding hands, fireside romantic chats. I'm not buying what you're seeing. It doesn't add up. That's true, but maybe new places. B.S. Lynn. I remember our conversation very clearly and you don't get to rewrite history. If you've changed your mind, just say so, but don't lie and pretend you didn't challenge me to spice things up physically. Ty, why are you being like this? You're being so literal and dogmatic. Maybe I said that, but how could you interpret that to bending me over the counter, or leaving a bruise on my neck for everyone to see? Lin, do you remember what you were wearing when we had that conversation? What? No, why is that important? It's important because it is relevant to this conversation. I'd been out working in the yard and had just showered and come out of the bedroom. You were sitting on the bed wearing a very short pair of cut-off shorts and a halter top. Something I'd never seen you wear before. I was so turned on when you told me you wanted us to spice things up. I'm pretty sure we didn't come up for air for at least the next hour. So how do I go from that to romantic beach weekends holding hands? I'll let you pick 10 husbands of your choosing, tell them the story, and ask them how they'd interpret your invitation. If at least 9 of them don't say something along the lines of what I did earlier today, I'll buy you any new car you want. That is ridiculous Ty. No, not only is it not absurd, but it is also completely accurate. When you dress slotty for your husband and ask him for spice, it's not because you're in the mood for romance. Again, you're trying to change what happened to make you right and me wrong. Ty, your stubbornness isn't getting us anywhere. 
Why don't we just drop it and you come to bed and just hold me? Sorry Lin, not a chance. If you don't like that kind of behavior from me, fine, I'll never try it again. But don't treat me like a fool and demand this is my fault. You are more concerned with people seeing I gave you a hickey than my feelings or opinions. I have no interest in holding you, so you can believe I've admitted I'm wrong. Good night Lin. With that, I turned and headed for the guest bedroom. Ty, come back here, I'm not done talking to you damn it. I ignored her believing my first attempt to FWLH was successful. I'd avoided having sex with her without giving away my hand. I doubted seriously she was putting two and two together and coming up with four. She was too self-consumed to even flirt with the idea I knew she was ducking Justin Banks. We had chilly days in our marriage, but Sunday was beyond frozen. We avoided each other, never speaking. I guess she decided it was a battle of wills, and she would win by wearing me down. Lynn dressed in tight Lululemon workout shorts and a tight-fitting t-shirt. She looked good, but I wasn't the least bit interested in touching her. I spent most of the morning at the club and the afternoon working in the yard. I headed to bed before her and when she arrived in the bedroom I was already in bed. I'm not sleeping in the same bed with you until you apologize Ty. Fine with me Lynn. I'm not an unreasonable guy so I guess we'll go every other night in the master bedroom. This is my bed as much as yours so I'm sleeping here tonight. If you don't like it, you know where the spare room is. Tomorrow night, I'll sleep there, and you can be in here. I don't agree to that. Go sleep in the guest room until you come to your senses. Lin, I have no idea how you think you have the final say in everything around here, but you don't. We're equals and I'm treating us this way. Tonight, I'm sleeping in this bed, whatever you do is up to you. Bustard she spat as she left for the guest room. The early part of the week was more of the same. We barely spoke to one another. She continued to try and push my buttons, but I wasn't having any of it. On Monday night she made it a point to inform me how humiliated she was in though or when her co-workers teased her about her hickey. I shrugged my shoulders indicating my lack of care. On Tuesday morning Stan Rosen called and asked me to stop by his office. The bad news first. You have a very mild form of chlamydia. Chances are you haven't experienced any of the symptoms. Over half of the men who contract this don't. The good news is, with treatment it will clear up quickly, although you'll need to be rechecked in about 3 months. Any reason I should ask you if you know how you contracted it? Sure Stan, I got it from my wife. I'm trusting our doctor, patient confidentiality here. I've never slept with another woman since a year before Lynn and I became engaged. Last Thursday I discovered she was having a sexual affair with another man. I can only assume she got it from him unless there have been other lovers of which I'm unaware. He could hear the sadness in my voice. Well, I'm damn sorry to hear that, Tyler. I always thought you guys had a good marriage. I'll put you on a normal dosage of azithromycin, and as I said, it should clear up without any trouble. You'll need to tell Lynn and abstain from sex for the next few weeks just to be safe. The next morning, I was seated in the conference room of T.S. and S. Sharp was present, along with Pai Molly and one of his legal team, Mick Sawyer. We don't like the timing tie, but it's time to pull the trigger. Everyone agrees the STDs change the landscape. Have you thought about how you want to tell her? Yes, I have. One of my goals is to keep her off balance until she's served. What if you guys are aware of my notifying her, but for the moment she won't know the source of the information? Everyone around the table looked skeptical but kept silent, waiting to hear more. What if I send her option an anonymous text informing her that one of her patients, Lindsay Clinton had chlamydia? Wouldn't she be obligated by her Hippocratic Oath to inform her patient? You guys could testify later it was me, Molly can witness me texting, verifying date and time. I will have acted with a reasonable amount of good faith, since my doctor obligated me to tell her within 48 hours, and I did it in less than 30. It may be devious, but she will have the opportunity to get the medical attention she needs. Wouldn't that pass the smell test in court? There was a pause as Molly and Mick waited for Short to mull it over. After a few moments he spoke. Not perfect, not even good, but it's not terrible either. It will make you appear petty, but not negligent or criminal. Given the circumstances and the right judge it might be okay. However, it is also incomplete. Any judge will want to know who was aware of your actions and what steps they took to dissuade you. So, Tyler, I'll tell you right now, I don't think you should do this, and it is a bad idea. Me too, said Molly. I concur with Eli Tyler, Mick chimed in grinning from ear to ear. You shouldn't do this. On top of that, Sharp chimed back in, she will eventually put two and two together, and realize that if it wasn't Banks, it had to be you. She will be aware you know of her affair. Yes, but that will take a day or two so I can prepare for her. Thanks for your advice, everyone. However, I'm determined, so when I leave here, I'm getting a burner phone and sending Dr. Pamela Connors the message. 
In that case, I want to witness it, responded Molly. I don't want it to be set. I just trusted you to follow through, but never checked up to make sure it happened. We covered a few other details, and then I left. Forty minutes later, Dr. Connors received an odd text from an unknown source. On the other end, it was witnessed by Pi Molly Elkington. Dr. Connors, I'm choosing to remain anonymous, but I have it on good medical authority that one of your patients, Mrs. Lindsay Clinton, has the STD chlamydia. Now that you have this information, I trust you to act immediately as her primary physician and offer care for your patient. Thank you. I broke the phone apart when I finished and later that afternoon, on my way home tossed it into a pond about 5 miles from my house. Nobody was around to witness my complete disregard for the no littering laws of Iowa. About the time I was tossing away the burner, Molly was parked outside Dr. Connor's office when a black Honda Accord pulled into one of the parking spaces. Lynn emerged looking a bit disheveled and entered the office. 45 minutes later she came out looking worse. Molly followed her to a local pharmacy drive through where she picked up a small bag containing a prescription. Lynn arrived home shortly thereafter. I was sitting on our screened in porch watching a recap of the previous day's Cardinals 10-0 win over the Royals. Since we still weren't speaking much, she didn't stop to say hello she just headed up the stairs. About a half hour later she came out on the porch, freshly showered, and unexpectedly plopped down next to me letting out a deep sigh. Ty, can we call a truce and get back to us? I don't know Lynn, how would you suggest we call a truce? Can we just drop the entire argument and let it go? I'm not sure that works for me Lynn. Why not Ty? She looked like she genuinely wanted to know. Maybe the revelation of her STDs had jolted her a bit. I'm happy to forgive and move on Lynn. I apologize several times for misreading your spice it up a bit comments, but as far as I know you still don't think you've done anything for which you need to apologize. Dropping it, therefore, seems to mean you win, and I lose. I'm not trying to come out on top here Lynn, but I believe we're equally at fault for the last several days, but you don't see it that way. Fine she replied, with a bit of edge in her voice. I'm sorry. There, now are we okay? No Lynn, we're not. I've known you for almost 10 years and I know when you don't mean what you say. Your words may be correct, but your tone demonstrates your heart hasn't changed. Tell me I'm wrong Lynn. Explain your understanding of where you were in error, and we can move forward. She looked at me for the briefest moment with sadness in her eyes. I thought perhaps she was going to come clean about the entire episode of her cheating. I'd never expected a sincere apology given what I'd heard in the tapes, but perhaps I'd misjudged her. Could I forgive her and work on our marriage? To be honest the thought scared the shit out of me. I need to have worried. Her eyes gave her away as she returned to her righteous indignation. She still blamed me. At that moment, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, we were done. You're just so stubborn Tyler Adam Clinton. I apologized and you threw it back in my face because it wasn't up to your standards. Fine fine with me. You're causing this impasse, and it will be on you if we can't find a way to deal with this. Well Lindsay Abbott Simon using her maiden name intentionally, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I can see in your eyes and hear the tone of your voice that you may be using the right words, but you believe in your heart that you are innocent, and I am guilty. You are convinced I'm being prideful and unreasonable. So, I'll make you a deal. If you can find one of our close friends who truly believes I'm an arrogant bum who never apologizes or admits he's in the wrong, I'll accept your conclusion. She rose to her feet glaring at me and stomped off the porch into the house. I sighed deeply. It had been almost a week since I discovered her flagrant disregard for her vows and our marriage. The next two weeks were going to be nearly impossible. It was time to look for some options. The next morning, I was in my boss's office. Connie Silverton was a fair but hard-charging boss. You don't become CEO of a major medical facility if you're not. It was tough to do, but I laid out my situation for her. I needed some advice and some help to survive the next 14 or so days, until I served Lynn with divorce papers. Connie's response was professional but caring. First Tyler, I'm very sorry for your position. My folks divorced when I was 10 and it was awful. However, before we progress, I need to know you will weather this storm and continue your fine work for me in unity. I can't help if I know this situation is about to blow up and go to hell in a handbasket. Connie, I can't tell you I'll be worth a sheet for the next couple of weeks, but I genuinely love my job and the folks will do my work. You'll have my best going forward. I'm deeply wounded, but I'm not dead, and I have no intention of throwing away my career for a woman who has betrayed me. If I can get just a bit of short-term slack, I promise you'll have me 100%. I think I know you pretty well Tyler and I know I can trust you to shoot straight with me. There is a conference in DC next week for hospital CFOs. In the past I've declined your requests to attend because of cost. However, this year, I think it would be in Unity's best interest to have you go. It begins on Monday and ends on Thursday afternoon. 
As I recall, you have family on the East Coast, so why don't I approve you attending, and then you can stay the weekend with some family. That part you'll have to cover out of your own pocket. Deal. Boss, I'd hug you, but I know you'd probably smack me, and I have no interest in my taking my appreciation the wrong way. Hubby Mike was a retired army ranger colonel. But know this. I'll never forget your kindness and you will never regret helping me. She smiled as warmly as I'd ever seen her smile. I'll put the paperwork through today Tyler. If you can make it to next Sunday afternoon, I'll buy you a week. Now, get your bum out of here and figure out how we're going to sign a new contract with our nurses. Their union reps are driving a hard bargain. I rose and smiled, consider it done boss. By the way, if I can save us 5% on the next contract can we talk about my Iran bonus? Her normal glare reappeared which told me it was time to leave. I just needed to survive 3 days before heading to the conference. If I was lucky on the back end, it would only be 2 or 3 days after returning that I'd have to live in current tension. I was able to concentrate for the rest of the day and got a good bit of work done, even pissing off Jordy Meyer, the nurses union rep when I informed her their latest offer wasn't even in the ballpark. Let her sue over the weekend and next week, I thought to myself. Maybe a little pressure will land on her when her folks hear she doesn't have a deal, and there isn't even one on the horizon. On my way home I called my dad and brother to let them know I'd be in the area next weekend, and would love to connect. I apologize for the short notice, but both promised to carve out some time together. I wasn't looking forward to sharing the bad news with them, but then again, I knew they'd be supportive when they heard the entire story. My last call before pulling into my driveway was to Eli Sharp attorney at law. I quickly filled him in, and he let me know it was the perfect opportunity to stick one or two of Mary's people on Lynn, to get some more evidence of her betrayal. Lynn wasn't home when I arrived, which, under normal circumstances, would have been unusual. However, there had been nothing usual in my life for over a week. It was day two of her three-day break, so we'd have already had something planned. As it stood, she could be out ducking little Justin, or some other guy for all I knew. That was the first time it hit me that there could be or have been other men. Wouldn't that be a hit, I thought to myself. What if the hoe is running around on banks behind his back? Maybe I should send him an anonymous text as well urging him to keep taps on his cheating slot, lest he become her latest victim. I decided to go for a run. I ran a bit of cross country in high school although I was never great at it. However, running 3-5 to five miles a couple times a week did help me clear my head. My route was basically out to the golf course and back. A couple of good hills on the way out and back gave the run a good cardio element. I ran harder today trying to exhaust myself so I could perhaps sleep that night. My world was crashing in around me, and ever since I kicked it into survival mode, I rarely let myself slow down to take stock of my reality. It was good to run and think. I was depressed about Lynn's affair. Nine days ago, I was in love with a woman I thought loved me as much or more. Discovering that her vows didn't mean shit to her shook me to the core. How much of that was my fault I wondered as I grunted up hill number one. No marriage problems rest completely on one person. Perhaps I'd been too busy or preoccupied with my career, not giving her enough time and attention. Other questions swirled through my noggin as I continued my course. How would she react? Would she ever come clean and admit what she did? Would she excuse it or beg for forgiveness? I knew I wouldn't stay in the marriage after such a deep betrayal, but how would I treat her when I saw her around the hospital? Would I get pissed seeing her dating other men? Would she stick around or beat it out of town? I couldn't imagine her slinking off as if she were defeated. She would be too stubborn for that. No, I assumed, she'd stick around and try to prove to me that I was a complete fool for divorcing her. It dawned on me that if I was thinking this hard, I wasn't running hard enough. By the top of hill 2 I was no longer preoccupied with thoughts of my soon-to-be ex-slot wife. I was just looking for little things like oxygen. When I returned home, I was completely spent, which was the idea behind the run in the first place. I walked up and down the street for 20 minutes cooling down, then hoped in the shower. Emerging I tossed on my swim trunks, grabbed a beer, and hit the hot tub, since my calf muscles were making me aware they hadn't appreciated the last hour or so. Still no sight of Lynn. Later, around 11pm I'd had some supper, watched two episodes of Ted Lasso, and finally crawled into bed. Lynn never arrived, nor did she text or call. I did her the courtesy of leaving her alone too. It was the only time in our marriage we'd been apart for over 12 hours without touching base or knowing where the other one was. I took two melatonin and four modern, since my calves were not letting up on their complaints. I slept straight through until 7am the next morning. Before coming down the stairs in the morning I noticed that Lynn's door was closed, so I guess she arrived home at some point the night before. I listened for a moment, nothing was stirring. I had some coffee and a couple bagels, showered, changed, and headed to the golf course. Late May weather in Des Moines can be spectacular, and today was no exception. 
I hit some balls on the range and joined a couple buddies for 18 and then lunch. By 3 p.m. I'd run out of excuses to stick around so I headed home. I'd not texted or called Lynn all day, and she had also ignored me. I guess we were waiting to see who blinked first. She wasn't home when I arrived, so I basically began a repeat performance of the night before. Sunday morning was the same, but I was headed out of town on a 4 p.m. swap flight to Reagan International. I cut the grass and worked in the flower beds most of the morning, something Lynn and I usually did together. When she finally appeared around 11 a.m. she just looked out the door at me and went back inside. Duck this I thought as I packed my bags. If she wants to stay away and silent, she's welcome to, but no way in hell I'm letting her control the game. I left for the airport without leaving her a note or texting her to let her know where I was headed and how long I'd be gone. I assumed she probably wouldn't even notice I was gone all week. I hope she did, and I hope she brought shit had Justin over and ducked him in our bed, so I could add that to her list of skunk behavior. On Tuesday two things happened. First, I got a call from Eli telling me Mary's folks already had several new pictures and videos of Lynn and Banks. No question they were going hot and heavy. The second one surprised me. Lynn finally texted me. The exchange wasn't polite. Where are you? DC? WTF? I'm at a hospital CFO conference Connie wanted me to attend. When were you going to tell me you inconsiderate bustard? Whenever you came home before 1 or 2 in the morning and had a conversation with your husband who had been waiting for you since 6 on both Friday and Saturday. Where were you each night? She ignored the question. Ty, I was scared to death something had happened to you. I can't believe you'd do that to me. Why didn't you just text me? I did, you didn't answer. Lie 1. If you did text me and I didn't answer, did you call the cops? What? When you were scared to death something happened to me, did you call the cops? Oh, well no, I guess I didn't think of that. Still, you such a prick for not communicating with me. How about my boss, or my dad, or my brother, or any number of our friends? Who did you contact trying to track me down to make sure I was okay? I reached out to several people. Don't try to put this on me Ty. Lie to. Name them. What? Name who you texted or called so I can verify. I wouldn't be insulted by such an insensitive and uncaring a hole like you. Well Lynn, you may believe me to be a prick, and uncaring or insensitive, but I'm not a liar like you. If you were truly concerned for my well-being, you would have texted me, which we both know you didn't. Secondly, you would have reached out to one of our friends, co-workers, or family members, which we also know you didn't. What we don't know is where you were on Friday or Saturday nights. Care to elaborate on your whereabouts? Anything you need to confess to me to your wife? You're just so insanely stubborn Ty, I'm really at my wit's end with you right now. Well Lynn, I guess you're incapable of telling the truth or accepting responsibility for anything you've done or are doing so just one more thing duck you. No response was forthcoming from the other end, just radio silence. Was she beginning to suspect you knew something? Was she feeling any shred of guilt for her actions of betrayal? Did she even consider what she was doing infidelity? I realized my breathing was heavy, and I was perspiring like I'd been working out for an hour. I compassed myself, showered and headed out to the conference. The rest of the week went fine considering my marriage was over and I was an emotional wreck. I did manage to make some good connections and attend a couple of informative breakout sessions. The weekend with my dad and brother was good but tough. Both sought to be understanding, but neither shared my experience. Mom had passed away about 3 years ago at the age of 63 from a rare form of cancer. She slipped away holding the hand of the man who had loved and cherished her for 41 uninterrupted years. Dad could relate to my sorrow, but not the pain of Lynn's duplicity. He thought she was star craving mad. My brother, Elliot had been married for 11 years to an amazing woman named Mary. They and their three kids seemed to be doing just fine even when dealing with some of the bumps in the road. Mary and Elliot still looked at each other with adoration, and they settled their infrequent disputes quickly and without too much rancor. My brother seemed to be heading down the same marital pathway as dad. I was happy for him. We played a couple rounds of golf, took in a nationals game and had some great meals. I enjoyed reconnecting with my nephews. Sunday evening came way too quickly as I hugged dad on the curb of Reagan. He grabbed my face in his hands looking sternly into my eyes. I know it hurts like hell son, but you'll pull through. Lynn turned out to be selfish and destructive, but don't you give up. You keep pushing forward, one day at a time. I know this much is true, the pain will subside. With that, he hugged me, hopped back into his Ford F-150, and headed back to Springfield, Virginia. When I arrived at DSM it was almost noon. I headed into the office to catch up on some details and find out if the week I was gone began to move Jody Meyer off the dime on our negotiations. Good news there, her latest proposal was much closer than the last. 
There was still a gap, but it was clear her nurses didn't want a prolonged work stop page, and they knew Unity would be reasonable at the bargaining table. Before I left, I stuck my head in Connie's office. She lit up and gave me her normal, what the duck are you going to waste my time with now look. I just stood there for a moment and smiled. Well, hey boss, just wanted to say thanks again for last week. It was a good seminar, well worth the investment, and time with my family was just what the doctor ordered. Like I give a duck Tyler, have you gotten anything useful done since you've been back? Not much, just reviewed the nurse's latest proposal and thought I'd let you know we'll have a deal we can live with by the end of this week. No need to thank me. Get the hell out of my office Tyler and come back when you actually have something for me. I always enjoyed this banter, but today it struck me as more important than usual. Before I turned to leave, I paused. Hey boss. Connie looked up, what? Love you too. I bolted from the door before the pen she had in her hand was hurled in the general direction of my face. Sometimes normal life, working with people you care for and respect was some of the best medicine in the world. Maybe dad was right. Perhaps the pain would begin to ebb. On my way home I phoned my attorney to get an update on where we stood. A minute later Eli Sharp was on the phone. Come by my office at 7 tomorrow morning on your way to work Ty. I think we're ready to pull the trigger. Sad to say, Lynn kept at it with her at Iparamara over the weekend. I won't give you too many details, although we have some explicit pictures of her in a very revealing schoolgirl outfit at their favorite hotel. The house was dark, quiet, and empty when I arrived. It felt like Lynn and I were already over. We barely seen each other for the past three weeks, and hadn't had one civil conversation since before I left for the conference in Kansas City over three weeks ago. I realized how much I missed her. Not the slot she turned into, but the Lynn I married. Fun-loving, curious, mischievous, beautiful, and strong-willed, she was the person with whom I thought I'd spend my entire life. I dropped my bag in the laundry room, grabbed a beer, and settled on the back porch as the sun faded in the west, and the stars began their nightly dance. For all my anger at her utter betrayal, I found myself in tears once again. I knew one day I would have no more tears for her or marriage. I was never going to stand for her duplicity and infidelity. If I could figure a way to duck over Justin, I would. My pride was bruised but still intact. But tonight, I would allow myself to grieve what was lost. By 10pm I was beyond exhaustion, so I headed upstairs had a quick shower, and was asleep about 20 seconds after my head hit the pillow. Since we were sleeping in different beds, I didn't hear her come in. It could have been 5 minutes after I was asleep or 3 in the morning. I didn't know and I didn't care. I was up and out the door around 5.30am wanting to get a quick workout in before meeting Silas and team at 7. Lynn's car was parked in the driveway, and the door to the guest room was closed. If I read her schedule correctly, she was in her first day of a three-day rotation. That was helpful. We wouldn't have to cross paths very much in the coming week. Ty, nice to see you, come on in and have a seat, Eli welcomed me upon arrival. Super private eye Molly was on hand as was one of Silas's assistants, an older woman, maybe in her late 50s named Peggy Simons. She went by Peg. Molly smiled and said hello, Peg asked if I wanted coffee. After a minute or two we got down to business. Sharp began. We'd like to serve Lynn at some point this week, Ty. Molly has gotten more than enough evidence to demonstrate a pattern of infidelity on the part of your wife. More of the same wouldn't help our cause, and you already owe Molly over six grand, so I'd thank her, but cut her loose to do her snipping somewhere else. He smiled as he said the last line, it was clear they were good friends. For her part Molly just shot Eli the bird, got up to take her leave. I hope you get this settled as quickly and painlessly as possible Tyler, she said as she shook my hand. I thanked her and told her I truly hope I'd never need to employ her in the future, but would be more than happy to tell anyone in need of her services where to find the best. Eli and I knocked around several ideas about how, when, and where to have Lynn served. My hope was it could be done at work at a moment when she and piece of she Justin were together in a room full of people. Perhaps late in the day on Thursday as that would be her last work day before three days off. Eli thought waiting that long only played to Lynn's advantage. To wait is to give her a chance to find out what is in the works. You've done an amazing job of keeping your composure over the last several weeks Ty, but you must be at a breaking point. Let me suggest we serve her today or at the latest tomorrow. One of Molly's guys has been on hospital surveillance, so he'll have a good idea of when to best spring or surprise on her. I granted this was wise. Last night I cried all the tears I would shed over the line which. I was ready for the final confrontation. My mind drifted back to my favorite Clint Eastwood flick, Outlaw Oze Wales, when Oze confronts three of his enemies. Well, you boys gonna pull them pistols or just stand there and whistle Dixie. The challenge was hurled, the fight was on. Sharp also had found an obscure state law that allowed me to sue Justin Banks for a form of alienation of affection. 
Eli was certain it wouldn't go anywhere, but the embarrassment of everyone at the hospital knowing may cause him some serious relational and career pain upon completion of med school. I was all in. Finally, we agreed Eli would call and give me a heads up when the deed was done. I'd be at home on the back porch and talk with Linda. Sharp also wanted to have evidence of that conversation just in case things got out of hand. He asked Peg to make sure one of Molly's guys put some surveillance gear on our back porch and be in a car around the corner. If it got too heated or if Lynn became violent, he'd be able to call the police. I couldn't imagine Lynn going that nuts, but then again, four weeks ago I would have called you crazy if you suggested my wife was banging a med student and playing Sally schoolgirl with the sleazeball. I spent the day going back and forth with Jody Meyer over the last sticking point in our contract negotiations. By 3pm I was worn out, but we had a deal. Neither of us were 100% satisfied, so it was probably a fair agreement. The nurses got a decent bump in base pay, overtime and vacation days, and the hospital got a 5-year contract, instead of the original 3-year time frame the Inu was hoping for. Even Connie had to smile when I dropped the paperwork on her desk to take to the board. I was 5 minutes out from the house when my phone beat. It was Eli Sharp. Well, Barrister, how are we faring today? Sharp was chuckling, I'm sorry Ty, I know this is tough for you, and I'm not making light of your situation, but I just heard from Molly. She volunteered to serve Lynn and Banks. They'd just come out of a lengthy surgery and were in the staff lounge along with another nurse, the surgeon who operated in Mike Devlin, the head of surgery for all of Unity Healthcare. He stopped in to observe since the main surgeon was Alex Greer, one of the best cutters anywhere. Devlin and Greer were at Yale together back in the day, so they connect often. Anyway, Molly pops in the staff lounge looking like, well looking like Molly, which would scare just about anyone, and apparently med student Banks was offended by a non-medical person in their private space. He stood up and asked her if she was lost. When she said no, he replied something along the lines of this area is off limits to anyone who isn't on medical staff, and she should leave. Now I'm quoting Molly, can you believe that little pile of crap talking to me like that? So, I shoved him down back down in his chair and leaned in close. I'm pretty sure he began pissing himself at that point. I gave him my best kite town glare and said, are you the married woman ducking piece of sheet known as Justin Banks? He barely croaked out, yes. Well then sonny boy, you've been served. She continued, it was damn silent in the room by now with the other four staring at me. When I turned my attention to cheating skunk Lynn, I thought she would melt. I took a much nicer tone with her, but I'm guessing everyone could hear the sarcasm in my voice. And you sweetheart, are you Lynn Clinton, wife of Tyler Clinton? She nodded her head in the affirmative and barely above a whisper replied, yes. Well, in that case I assume you are very well acquainted with Mr. Banks here, and you too, my dear have been served. Molly told me it was one of the best moments she's had in a couple years. She wanted to enjoy it while it lasted, so she hesitated to leave. Dr. Devlin addressed Banks, young man, if you've done what I think you've done, you'll never practice medicine in Iowa or anywhere else if I can help it. He also turned to Lynn as he put two and two together and spoke directly to her. Please tell me you're not that completely stupid Lynn. She hung her head and as Molly left, she heard Devlin say, Lynn, it would be wise for you to go home and not return to work until one of your union reps speaks with you. Sharp finally stopped giggling and compassed himself. So, Tyler, your wife has been served and she's on her way home. Molly's guy is about a block away and will be tuned in. Brace yourself son, I believe you're in for one of the worst moments of your life. Be firm, but don't scream or rant. If it gets to be too much just go for a walk or go to another room. You can do this Tyler, the toughest part is almost over. We chatted for another moment talking about next steps. I got the impression Eli wanted to stay with me for as long as possible, helping me prepare emotionally for the potential shitstorm that was about to erupt. As we were wrapping up, I heard Lynn's car pull into the driveway. I thanked Sharp and told him I'd call him when we were done with an update. Lynn came through the door and found me on the back porch. She looked a mess. Clearly, she had been crying her eyes out on the drive home. As I look up it seemed to be a mixture of sorrow and rage looking back at me. She began. How long have you known? Three ducking miserable weeks Lynn. How did you find out? Not that it matters, but I came home early from the conference in KC to surprise my wife and spent some extra time with the woman I loved and cherished. When I arrived early Friday morning, you weren't here. I checked my glimpse app and saw you were somewhere near the airport. It went downhill quickly from there. The morning you called me about the pen. Yep. You lied to me, you were setting me up. Well, I guess if anyone would know what a lie was, it would be you since you've taken it to an art form with me, but yes, I lied. I wasn't trying to set you up, I was trying to determine if my world was truly crashing down around me. Sadly, it was. She sat for a moment in silence. 
I wasn't inclined to ask her anything. Now that it was out in the open, I just wanted to deal with whatever had to be done and get the hell away from her. Finally, she continued. I can't believe you had me served at work, in front of my colleagues. I was humiliated. Take a number and get in line, Lin. That was just cruel, Ty. Your approach doesn't leave much room for us to work things out. Again, Lin, if anyone would recognize cruel, I believe it would be you. Your betrayal is the cruelest thing anyone has ever done to me in my life. However long you've been ducking Justin Banks, you've been heaping on cruelty after cruelty on someone you said you loved. Aside from that, let me be very, very clear. I have no desire to work things out with you on any level. I'm divorcing you and not looking back. You must be delusional to think you could treat me this way, and I'd want anything to do with you ever again. She finally sat down on the other end of the sofa for me. But Ty, I do love you. I see what you're saying, but I never intended her to cruelty. Justin was just a little fling. I know it was wrong and I shouldn't have done it, but I know we can work through this like adults and come out stronger for it. Lin, I'm trying to keep my composure here, but did you wake up and take a stupid pill this morning? You and Banks playing doctor and schoolgirl and whatever other sex fantasies you should only be enjoying with your husband has put an end to us. Any reasonable adult could see that. Yes, I've seen pictures and video of several of your romps at the airport Hampton Inn. You can't possibly be so childish as to think if you play the sorrowful wife, I'll just ignore the crushing hurt and pain you've brought into my life. I can't believe you spied on me in just in time. Why didn't you just talk to me about it when you found out? I could have stopped it with him immediately. You've taken this to the extreme. Lin, I shouldn't have to spy on you. There should have been nothing hidden between us, especially infidelity. Why would I talk to you about anything? Nothing that comes out of your mouth will ever be believable to me again. Extreme is ducking around on your faithful husband Lin. Take a look in a damn mirror for a moment and pray you can see the truth. I had no clue if my suddenly idiotic wife was getting any of this or not. Nothing seemed to be sinking in. She was just looking for an easy way out to brush past her treachery. Every time she opened her mouth, more nonsense flowed. Ty, divorce is the last thing either of us should want. We not only live here, but we work at the same hospital. What will people think? It will be so awkward if we end up divorced, living and working at the same place. On top of that how humiliating for both of us for colleagues and friends to hear some of these details. Come on baby, surely you can see how bad it would be for both of us. Lin, I've been living with awkward and humiliation ever since the Friday morning I saw you and Duckwood coming out of the Hampton Inn, right after you lied to me on the phone about where you were and what you were doing. Divorce will be a welcome relief for me, as the attention will be directed to you as well, when folks learn of your betrayal and slotting around. I'd ask you if baby boy Banks was your first and only extramarital affair, but no matter what you say I wouldn't believe you. Thank goodness there are no children yet. The thought of parenting with you makes me want to throw up. Why the hell would you want to stay married to a man for whom you have no respect? Ty what can I say to make you understand Justin was just a dalliance, a fling, nothing more. No emotion no love just a naughty sexual distraction. I see now that it was wrong of me to fool around, but surely you must know I love you and want to be only with you. I promise from this moment forward, I'll never even look at another man. Well Lin if you put it that way, let me just say you must be the most delusional ducking hoe ever to walk the planet. You lied to me and deceived me for several months, then gave me an STD you contracted from your boy toy, and I'm supposed to just say, okay doki, sweetheart, no worries, let's just pretend nothing happened and get back to the honeymoon. Let me be crystal clear Lin. I will never touch you again. I'm divorcing you ASAP even if I come out on the short end of the stick financially. I'd rather live in a shack destitute and alone than in a mansion with you. The pain I've experienced for the last month was almost more than I could bear. If it wasn't for the support of family and friends, I'm pretty sure I'd be face down in a ditch someplace. You did that to me Lin. Your cheating, lying, callousness and absolute hateful behavior to me almost did me in. But you didn't Lin. I'm still standing, and I intend to make my way as best as I can, while putting you in my rear view mirror and never looking back. I don't know if I got through to her, but tears did begin to well up in her eyes. I'm sorry Ty was all she said before heading upstairs to the bedroom beginning to realize what she'd done and the repercussions to follow. Sorry doesn't begin to describe you Lin was all I said in return. Six months later we were divorced. Neither of us wanted the house and so it was sold, and we split the equity. Everything else was also pretty much 50-50, but I came out ahead on the alimony side of the deal, as the judge didn't award any to Lin. When he made his ruling, Lin's lawyer began to protest, but the judge cut her off. Ms. Bannister, your client should be thankful I'm restrained by the law, and must give her a 50-50 split. I don't care for dishonest people, and she clearly cannot be trusted to tell the truth on any level. She's getting everything the law says I must give. 
The rest is at my judicial discretion, counselor, so don't press your luck. Court adjourned. I don't know, maybe it was me, but he sounded an awful lot like the Duke. Epilogue. My name is Connie Silverton, Tyler Clinton's boss at the hospital. My husband Mike and I were devastated for Tyler and the suffering he endured thanks to his witch wife's actions. The divorce was finalized, but there's a bit more to the story. First, Tyler was a mess for a couple months. He had to endure Lynn's constant harassment and stalling tactics in the divorce. However, Eli Sharp is as good as they come, and he took care of Tyler all the way through. Tyler took a big hit financially with all the fees, but in the end, he was a free man, a very talented man, and a young man, so I knew in the end he'd land on his feet. Although it's been over three years since the divorce, he hasn't started dating yet, but he has good people around him, and apparently a certain young lady from Cedar Bluffs, who comes to town to visit her Aunt Beth, has caught his eye. As far as the hospital staff was concerned Lindsay became a pariah. None of the married nurses wanted anything to do with her. A few of the more obnoxious doctors, both married and single, tried to better, since they all hear from Justin Banks how easy she was. Within six months of the divorce, she turned in her resignation. Moving to Denver she began working at a hospital there. About a year after that we heard she married a young and rising star surgeon. A couple of our crew ran into her at a seminar, and she seemed to think she'd come out better for dumping, in her words, her first loser husband. Tyler Banks was also ostracized even by some of the slammier doctors. Tyler had such a good reputation across the hospital, even the physicians who saw themselves as players didn't want to have anything to do with him. He finished his residency but only received mediocre recommendations when it came to placement. Banks ended up working at a regional hospital in Frankfort, Kentucky, probably making about half of what he would have if he'd been a decent human being. He also married a beautiful southern girl land, from what we hear they are happily married now these three years. So that's the end of this follow-up except for one small detail. Last night my husband Mike, retired army guy, invited Tyler over for dinner. A bit unusual for him, but not completely unheard of. We enjoyed some grilled steaks and a good wine. After dinner Mike asked us to join him in front of the big screen in the living room. Tyler and I looked at each other like, what the hell? But Mike had our attention. He took on his old army colonial posture and began. Tyler and Connie, what we witness and speak of tonight is for the three of us alone. What we see will be destroyed, and it will never be brought up or mentioned again. I knew this side of Mike and nodded in agreement. Tyler noticed me doing so and responded, okay Mike, whatever you say. Tyler, almost four years ago a despicable woman and a piece of sheet, did grievous harm to a man who both Connie and I love like a little brother. We spent many hours talking about this injustice, and we prayed that someday, perhaps in some way the scales would be balanced. As you know I have many, many friends, and contacts throughout the government from 24 years in uniform. I've accumulated quite a handful of IOUs over the years, and in the last 12 months I've called in a few markers. Please watch the screen. We watched two videos over the next 20 minutes with our mouths hanging open in shock. The first was of Dr. and Mrs. James Thaddeus of Denver, Colorado. Mrs. Thaddeus, the former Mrs. Tyler Clinton was weeping and screaming at her husband. You mother ducker how could you do this? I've been faithful to you since we married and today, I get a video of you ducking some bimbo ho at the Hampton Inn. You bustard, I hate you, I hate you. How could you cheat on me and ruin us? I'm going to duck and kill you in the divorce, get out of my house now. As Dr. Jim rose and left Lindsay just sat and sobbed until she held up an envelope opened it and read, Betrayal hurts like a witch don't it slot. The second video was Justin Banks standing outside what appeared to be his Kentucky home. It looked to be in a quiet area with no other houses close by. His sweet southern wife was crying her eyes out as she held a handful of 810 glossy pictures of hubby ducking some hot 20 something from behind. As the camera panned back three large men began moving toward Banks. One of them was wearing a sheriff's uniform. So, Mother Ducker, you thought you could screw around on our sister and get away with it. There won't be enough pieces of you left to identify if your body parts are ever found. Banks was crying like a baby. Before the screen went blank the man in uniform could be heard saying, By the way, Tyler Clinton's friend Colonial Silverton sends his best. One more scene popped up. It was a gorgeous young lady who looked like the woman in the video and the pictures. She simply smiled at the camera and said, Mission accomplished.